So this panel, The Four Corners, House, Hip Hop, Acid Jazz, Intersections, um, is pretty uh, special to me. When I think about the Four Corners of what we call the Four Corners, which is the Milwaukee, uh, Damon, North Avenue corridor where Lit X sat right there, Double Door, Red Dog, The Note, um, all those spaces were popping in terms of uh, urban and black and brown social culture at a certain part of the early 90s. And in those spaces, you had so much going on between poetry, one space, hip hop, one space, house, one space, and there was all these intersections. It was actually through house that led me to acid jazz that led me to hip hop. So, um, that's why I kind of really wanted to have this conversation beyond me and so because there was a point where they had finally, it was after we talk about that, se that segregation that seemed to exist for so long between the house and hip hop culture, there was the four corners that end up being the bridge between those two worlds that allowed these quote unquote separate communities to convene and to communicate and to eventually be uh, a bigger community. And on this panel, I have four people who are definitely four of the most influential to me people from that time period um, who are still really much, pretty much uh, moving, these, moving these cultures forward and keeping the culture alive and so on and so forth. There's about four of my favorite people on the planet. So I want to introduce them. Um, I don't have a bio for her, but I just know she's so dope that I'll need a bio. First, I'm going to introduce Miss Lori Branch. Laura Branch, also known as DJ Lori Branch, is a Chicago native with over 35 years of experience as a local artist, DJ, and public health advocate. Lori has been featured in the film The Unusual Suspects, Once Upon a Time in House Music, two BBC documentaries, and Chicago Magazine. She has the honor and distinction of being one of the first female DJs in Chicago's historic house music scene. Lori has held res DJ residencies in numerous Chicago venues and has co-produced music for independent film projects. Lori also co-hosts the Ventures House radio program on Northwestern University's WNUR, Evanston, Chicago. In her, day, in her day job, Lori is a senior regional director in Government Affairs, Gilead Sciences, Inc., where she oversees regional and national HIV and HCV initiatives. Prior to her role with Gilead, Lori worked with the Chicago Department of Public Health, where she managed STI, HIV, and LGBT health programming. As an ardent believer in the power of media and social marketing, Laura developed a number of public health television programs, training videos, public service announcements. Laura has a bachelor's of arts, a bachelor's of arts from Columbia College, Chicago, and a master's of science degree in human service administration from Spurtis Institute of Chicago. Welcome the legendary Miss Laura Branch. Coming from the rubble of the world of music, the universe inserts panelists, Fathom DJ. With the forces of creativity and positive energy, she is expanding the universe, the universal language of love. Her love of music spans from down to up-tempo house, garage, and expands to classic and current, hip-hop, classic to new soul, acid jazz to rare grooves, afro to electronic beats always keeping a mindful twist on popular music. Fathom shows DJ and has her first instrument of musical expression at, and set her foundation. She has spun a variety of private and commercial events, opening for such corporate and independent brands that span from Home Depot, Oracle Technology, Sting, Roy Ayers, Kendrick Family Soul, and Eric Robeson, amongst others. Fathom has given birth to numerous events, including Stellar Evolution, She Can Bang, the Boundless so Sound Experience, and Storytellers, all of which showcase her own talents as well as those of other creatives in the Chicago area. She is currently in the studio writing and producing original music and art for her forthcoming, forthcoming multimedia project, Sights and Sound. Through music, Fathom DJ is touching a wide audience, 
of listeners with goals to secure her space as one of Chicago's one of the most respected female DJs. Fathom look forward to expanding that title to the planet. Let's give it up for my girl. Panelist Jesse De La Pena's name has been synonymous with Chicago's music scene for over 30 years. Known for pushing musical boundaries and taking his audience on a journey, spinning records since 1985, his roots can be traced back to Chicago's early b-boy hip-hop scene, the breakdancing and graffiti art movement. Jesse helped lay the foundation for Chicago's vibrant hip-hop scene through his weekly hip-hop club night, the Blue Groove Lounge from 1994 to 2003, which he's been kind of resurrecting that a little bit recently. We'll talk about that, though. The event showcased both national and local performance in DJ's Weekly, one of the nation's longest-running hip-hop events. You just never know who you might see hanging out or performing. Seamlessly bridging different musical genres, fusing jazz, funk, soul, reggae, hip-hop, rock, new wave, disco house, Latin world, and classic dance music into a unique style of his own. In the early 90s, Jesse started experimenting with various local musicians while working at Chicago's Smart Bar. These improvised jam sessions grew into the Grammy-nominated band Liquid Soul, a 10-piece acid jazz ensemble co-founded by Jesse and guitarist Tommy Klein. The group enjoyed success both locally and on the national level Liquid Soul was invited to play the inaugural parade in the 21st Century Ball during the 53rd presidential inauguration. Nominated Best Club DJ by various Chicago publications, the Chicago Sun-Times, Chicago Tribune, New City, You Are Chicago, The Reader, and City Search. Through New York's Giant Steps and Groove Academy, Jesse has appeared in New York clubs, Irving Plaza, SOBs, Tramps, Wetlands, Supper Clubs, and various parties in um, with New York favorites DJ Spinner, Jazzy Jeff, Jazzy Nice, DJ Smash, Bobito, Tony Touch, and Rich Medina. He has also been featured guest DJ at various LA parties, including Brass, Chocolate Bar, and The Do-Over. Jesse has appeared in TV commercials and print ads for McDonald's, Midwest Stereo, Sure Microphone, Gemini Mixes, and the Interloy Lotteries uh, Players Have Your Fun campaign. Jesse is the host of the pro, uh, and producer of Vocalo Radio's 91.1 FM's 5 o'clock mix and the Friday Night DJ series. He's the founder of the Quest for the Beat DJ competition. The winners were selected to, to be members of Vocalo DJ Collective made up of some of the country's D, top DJs and turntablers. He's also known, he's also created the No Chicago music series and curates special music programming that highlights artists that are meaningful to the urban alternative experience. Vocal Radio is the sister station of WBEZ, Chicago Public Media. Let's give it up for the legend, Jesse De La Pena. <laughs> and our moderator from the evening is often referred to as Chicago's godfather of hip hop of the hip-hop scene. He is best known for hosting and promoting the $3 Sunday hip-hop show at Lower Links in 1992 and Saturday nights at Red Dog Nightclub. He started off as an MC in the group He Who Walks Through, He Who Walks Three Ways. Later as producer, he worked with Larry Miller, Juice, Ange 13, Nemesis, Daily Planet, Paraplegic, I don't know, there's all various ways from Brooklyn and a slew of other MCs. He was also the hip hop buyer at Beat Parlor, record store in, in, in Wicker Park. He is, and in the now, he is about to produce a legacy LP featuring some of his tracks as a collective, tracks and a collective of voice vocal creatives. That was kind of mildly because Duro has uh, been a staple on this scene for so many, so many. I remember going, first going to the shelter uh, to check him out. Uh, spinning funk breaks and stuff at the shelter. So he's done a lot. So let's give it up for our moderator, Darrell Wicks. All right, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Let me just start by saying they put me here and gave me no format, no nothing. I can say that I'm proud to sit on this panel because I have worked with each one of them in one capacity or another throughout my 
illustrious career. I can also say I've worked with almost every panelist that has been up here today at one point or another. I think, I'm just speaking for myself right now. Uh, I have the four corners. I'm all about that, both in terms of what this panel is about and in terms of that street down the street, that corner down the street. We, we ran that. We started that. We, we put in the blood, sweat, and tears to make this neighborhood what it is now. Because it wasn't this when we first got here in the early 90s. It was something totally different. And I, I appreciated what it was because you, uh, those of you here early heard Howard talk about cheap apartments. I had one of those, $500, four bedrooms, four floors up, graffiti all the way from the top to the bottom, you know, kind of clean, kind of not, you know. <laughs> I had at least 20 different roommates over the few years I lived there because the rent was so cheap, people came and went. It wasn't a flop house, but it was some flopping going on. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this neighborhood, I wasn't born in this neighborhood. I migrated from the south side to this neighborhood. Um, I'm from High Park and Chatham originally. And, and I just wanted to say this. Um, because I think part of what I've done was open the city up to people from other parts of the city. That's what Lower Links was about to me. Lower Links was an open mic show we did in 92. Lori was, it wasn't in her bio, but she was my DJ in the hip hop world. She's a triple threat, house, AIDS awareness, and hip hop, Chicago hip hop. Triple legend threat. Um, I worked with good people then and um, at Lower Links, you found, oh, it finally rained. You found crews, it rained for me. Uh, those are God's tears of happiness. Um, people from all over the city came, and it was in um, Wrigleyville, and met there, and met each other there, and I saw crews form out of that, and groups form out of that, and relationships form out of that, and babies form out of that. and. My whole thing was my father, he was a thrift store junkie before y'all knew what thrift stores were. You know, he was doing that in the 80s. And he would take us along so we knew that there was more than just Chatham and High Park in this city. We were in Bridgeport, we were up here, uh, here. You know, we were all over the city. So when it came time for me to go outside of that, it wasn't a big deal to come north go to Smart Bar and Riviera Nightclub and all the places I ended up doing things, you know, throughout uh, my career in different, wearing many different hats. Um, you know, I totally forgot what the hell I was talking about. I had, a, I had a goal, I had a vision of where I wanted to go. Four Corners. I'm the catalyst of all of this. That's my go-to. <laughs> But no, seriously, I had, I've had, a, like Howard said, things just kind of fell in my lap. And if I was ready to do them or able to do them, I did them. And I was, this is uh, footage from the very last Lower Link show that we did over on Newport in uh, Wrigleyville that really has not been shown anywhere in the 20 years, 20 plus years since. Um, is it still playing? Yeah. I can't turn my neck too far, so. <laughs> Take your word for it. Um, and then when we came over here just doing Red Dog, and I was blessed at Red Dog to do underground hip hop, to do down tempo, to do, I did a house night there with some people, with some, with Javon and other house DJ. I, and then I did Saturday nights there, which was just like an urban juke joint, you know, $20 a head, packed every night, at least a thousand people. Um, I've been blessed, you know, truly, truly blessed in my career. Cause I don't even call it a career cause I really just did things to do them, you know? And I think that's what is, is the key to my personal success. Uh, I love music. Um, Dwayne just said, how'd you say it? You came from? Mine is exactly the opposite. I grew up in Chicago, so I was house because everybody was house, which led me to Herb, Herb Kent's New Wave Punk Out on the radio, which led me to um, 
to hip hop through groups like uh, Tackhead, and I found out the house band for Tackhead was the 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 band Tackhead was the house band for Sugar Hill Records, and that led me into hip hop, and that was all in the early in the late '80s, early '90s. So my my journey was the exact opposite of yours, uh, and ended up in hip hop. But I have a love for all music, especially soul and down tempo stuff. So that's me. Was I supposed to say anything more than that? The bar has been set. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I don't know where to start. Let me tell you this about each one of them in my, in my experience. These two I had spin together, as well as she spun for me at Red Dog several other times. And right, then they had their own, they went and cut me out and had their own thing. <laughs> Lori had been spinning house for years and we met at the Museum of Science and Industry. And I convinced her to, even though it wasn't her genre, it'd be a good look with me and uh, Grandy Coup to be Juba to be our DJ. And I, I wanna say we were before the, the whole Diggable Planets, male, female, Fuji's thing. I was ahead of my time, I knew it. And, 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 and on this video, I have footage of myself. I was not as dope as I remember. I, I thought I was. It was hard to watch. But at the time when we were doing it, I was the flyest MC in the world. Looking back, no, not so much. And so she was our DJ for that. And then she was the house DJ for a lot of, we had a Big Lip Productions. She would spend those parties too as well. Jesse was doing his own thing for years before me, okay? This is a true B-boy in my, in my vision. Um, I'm actually jealous of his past when he posts on Facebook. Oh, he did that, he did that too, he was doing that, he knew them and he, he tagged them. But he was the very first person to, outside of my production crew to ask me to come and host because I am the best host in the world. <laughs> but I, ha I had to give it to him. I didn't realize it then, because you don't realize when you're going through, you know, to acknowledge what someone did. But he was the first. And, and then also, too, I think we did a comment show before you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mine flopped. His was an outrageous success. So. But you, you did at the Metro. We did at the Elbow. That's a big room to play. No, no, I'm not, I'm talking oh. about the Congress. Oh, okay. What did you do? Oh, no, that wasn't me. That was probably Domingo. Oh, I've been, I've been giving him way too much credit then. I take all that back. <laughs> but his shows at, 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 not at the con your shows at the at Vic. The Vic, Vic Theater. At the Vic, that's Fat what you write. and fresh lyrics. But uh, those were amazing shows. And I, I had a whole thing, but you just ruined it because you didn't want to take credit for the common show. I was going to ask you, know, how did you do better than we did? But you were kind of getting into that, uh, the the because uh, you did it in El at Elbow Room later. What was the difference? Why don't you let him talk about that? I, I'm asking him okay. to, and he's just sitting there <laughs> nodding and shaking his head. So what was the question? <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself, Jesse, and your. Talk about the well, I grew up in Hyde Park. No, that was you. You grew up in Hyde Park. I grew up on the south side, uh, the southeast side, south Chicago. Uh, moved around, south Deering, and then we moved to the southwest side, uh, 87th in Lawndale. So I was, uh, I was there for a little while. It was interesting, because I grew up southwest in a pretty mixed area. I lived in the projects, 106 in Bensley, lived uh, 87th in Manistee. It was always mixed. And then we, my mom got married and we moved to the southwest side and it was all white. So when I came over there, it was kind of interesting because folks would be like, talk, wh wh say that again, you, you talk funny or whatever. It was just a whole different experience. So coming from a mixed you know, area and then moving to the southwest side, if you're not from Chicago, when you think of the Southwest Side, you think of Marquette Park, you think about a lot of craziness that was happening back then. So, you know, things, I'd go to the 7-Eleven and buy a newspaper, and uh, just the 
conversation starter for folks around there would be like, yeah, there goes the neighborhood. How about these N words, you know? And they were, it was weird because I looked like these people. So they thought they felt comfortable, you know, being racist and whatnot around me. So it was a little weird. I don't know why I'm getting off on this tangent, but moving to the Southwest side, I did feel a little out of place. And then 83, 84 rolled around and we started discovering hip hop, break dancing, graffiti, house music. So went to high school and I felt like I was back in my element with all different type of folks and discovering you know, just different scenes, getting out of the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, I just had an interest in music always. So I uh, started writing graffiti, started break dancing, started throwing parties, and, uh, you know, just kind of ventured up to the north side and different, got out of the neighborhood and, uh, you know, met a lot of great people that I still am in contact with today. What was your first north side venue? That I that I played at, or I, it was mine, like my residency or something. Whoa. I think the first Northside gig I had was on Rush Street. I was filling in for Johnny Fiasco at a club called FX. And at that point, you know, I was into my new wave, alternative, industrial thing, and I didn't realize, you know, that I was gonna have to be there for like seven, eight hours and play all different kind of music. You know, I was kind of into what I was into. So I filled in for Johnny, and that was kind of cool. And then uh, I think my very first residency was at the Smart Bar. Joe Shanahan gave me my start. Um, I started working at Imports Records, and uh, the owner, Paul Weisberg, was friends with Joe. Paul always had people coming in. Frankie would come in. All, everybody, you know, they would c come see Paul. So I'd be working and, you know, they'd be hanging out and, you know, he'd, I'd be doing what I, my little DJ thing and he'd kind of catch me doing something. So at some point he uh, introduced me to Joe when he came in and, you know, he was like, hey, you know, check this kid out. He's doing something. So Joe, like, did something that doesn't happen anymore is he actually, like, kind of did, like, an audition. Like, he had me make a cassette. And then I went to the Metro, went up to his office, he put it in, we sat back and listened to the mixes, and he was like, oh, okay, I like, I like that, oh, that, oh, okay. So at that point, you know, I had not spun in 21 and over clubs. I was used to doing my 15 minutes or 20 minutes or 30 minutes at these little flyer parties, little banquet halls or what. So. You know, I got my big break uh, to spin at Metro or, or Smart Bar. And, uh, but the time was a little weird because the timing of me starting at Smart Bar, there was a really legendary DJ who used to do that night who recently passed away. His name was Mark Steffens. And uh, he was a billboard reporter. He was a really you know, amazing DJ. He broke a lot of music uh, at Smart Bar on Sundays and Wednesdays. And he had recently passed away of AIDS. And, you know, to be the young kid coming in from the South Side to take over this gig where everybody loved this dude. So as soon as I walked in, everybody, like, hated me. So they were like, you're never going to be like, I mean, I had a lot of people who you guys know in the scene, you know, come up to me on some, like, you know, I don't know why you're here. You're never going to do this, you know, that. So it was weird inheriting this amazing residency and then at the same time kind of trying to figure things out how it works in the 21 and over clubs you know um i was i was doing good i was making a hundred dollars a night i started at nine and went to 5 a.m i was coming i i worked nine to five i tell people i used to work nine to five saturday nights and I wasn't driving, so I'd bring records every week on the train, and I'd leave them, and they'd let me lock them up. And it's, it's funny because just getting home from that gig on a Saturday night was a task. It was like an adventure. I would leave at 5 a.m. Well, I would stop at 5 a.m. By the time I packed everything up, went to the, the train on Addison, took that to downtown, 
to the 62 Archer bus. Then I waited for the Pulaski bus to start. I got home about 9 a.m., 9, 10 a.m. every Saturday, and I slept a lot. But uh, I do remember some of the early days when I started coming into Smart Bar. Jeff Pazin used to let me get on the turntables for a little bit. And I, I met Duro at Smart Bar. I don't know if you remember this. One of the first times uh, we met, uh, I spun at Smart Bar, pl played a few records, and I came out of the DJ booth. And I also met Spencer Kinsey and Dave Gandhi that same night, around the same time. And he said, hey, man, I'm, uh, I'm throwing a party. Uh, Vince Lawrence, he's got this basement, and I'm going to do this party. Oh, wow. And we never got to do that party. Wow. So wow. ball's in your court. Let's make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's funny because I had the same smart bar going home adventures. We go, in the, we go during the week. And you catch the train, and then we get all the way to King Drive, because I was going southeast, and I had to sit there and wait for the first King Drive bus to start running to get the last little bit way home. Boy, we were dedicated. Uh, Miss Branch, you want to talk about your early, early days? Well, you know, I, I, I think you heard the bio, and I've been doing it for a long time. Just graduated from high school. I went to Lynn Bloom High School in, in um, Englewood, lived on Morgan Park. That was treacherous every day. Um, and started right out of high school. I, was, I had some friends who did social clubs were the thing, you know, and had some friends who started a social club and they were throwing these parties. This is around the same time, 1980, uh, that sort of we were transitioning from disco to what we think of as house. It was sort of like the house music culture. We weren't calling it that at the time. We were calling it punk out. You know, that's what we would put on the flyers, punk out. It's punk out music. And uh, whatever that meant, you know. So we would, uh, we'd, we'd throw parties in places like this. We'd see a room like this, like, this is ideal, we're doing something here. And we were doing parties along with like the Chosen Few and some of the other popular clubs, uh, groups back then. Uh, and I was just a club kid. You know, I was going to the warehouse. I was a little too young to get in. Jesse, I wasn't quite as young as you, but I was not of age, because you had to be 18 to get in. And I started going there at 17. And it was, it was this kind of magical experience, you know. you you can't understand what that feels like. And you know, you probably all have some place that is similar to you where you sort of caught the spirit. Like you understand what the ancestors are saying to you. Like, oh, okay, I feel I'm in this vibe now that I've never experienced before. And it is cracking something open inside my soul. And I'm just kind of infused with this, I don't know, magic potion. And, um, and, you, can, and you can't divorce yourself. Once you have experienced that, then you want to be a part of that. So I knew that I wanted to be a club kid. You know, like I, I didn't, there was nothing else I wanted to do on a Saturday night or Friday night. Then it became five nights a week, six nights a week. I remember my friend and I went on a diet. We were like, we're gonna go out four nights a week, okay? Promise, four nights and that's it. And that was like a sacrifice because we loved to have that experience. And it was shortly after that, that my friend Eric Bradshaw, who was a, uh, I went to high school with, and he was part of a New Expression newspaper. I don't know if any of you guys remember that, but that was like a big newspaper. And uh, he was a journalist and a photographer and a you know, really, really smart businessman at 18 years old. was like, look, we can make some big money. You should come. You like music. You got all these records. Jean-Pierre, my best friend, he had all these records. Like, you should DJ. And honestly, probably for the same reason that we hooked up in 91, 92, it was the same thing back in 80, 81, was that there's not, there's not any women on the scene. And, you know, you have an ear for it. Maybe you, maybe you have a talent for it because you actually did have to learn, a cra learn the craft back then. I mean, you still got to learn the craft. It's easier now because you got sync buttons and shit like that. But you did have to actually learn this skill, which is how do you listen to the, the sort of the physical skill of listening to music that's playing in a room listening to music that's playing in your head, figuring out you know, how to bring these things together seamlessly uh, in a way that makes people excited and that can hold a, an audience for an entire evening. I had one of those nine and fives too at CK's. It's Pride Month. That was a, a, a lesbian club. Nine to five, you know, and honestly, if any advice for DJs who are out there listening, get you a nine to five. Get you one nine to five residency where it's just you, you know, and build a crowd or join a crowd or whatever, because it's, it's a great way to learn. Um, and it, you know, you will be exhausted the next day, but 
it's a great way to learn. But anyway, that's that's how I how I got started, and I started spinning parties at the loft and the penthouse and Sours was where I made my debut in a DJ battle. First party, I was in a DJ battle. Uh, go figure. Well, but we had a lot of practice. Craig Loftus, Eric Bradshaw. Uh, my, my mentor was uh, Louis Gomez. His name was Jose Gomez back then. And Jesse was talking about earlier sort of the southwest side, which kind of gets forgotten, but Louis was part of that energy far southwest side of where a lot of early house music started. You know, he was really one of the pioneers, taught me how to DJ back in 1980. Did you want to comment on I that? I just want to uh, comment on a big up to Louis Gomez. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, and, I, and I don't know if this is true, I don't want to hijack the conversation, but I think he's the one who introduced Jamie Principal to Frankie Knuckles. He did. He did. He, and he also, too, I wanted to say, because um, I, I said Lori used to spin for us at, in our hip-hop group, and but she was house first, and I think <laughs> Chicago being a house city, has made our hip, our older hip hop DJs, ten times better. One hundred percent. Because we were 100%. taught by people who knew how to blend music. One hundred percent. We didn't just get into it. Oh, wiki, 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 wiki. I mean, most of the DJs I know who've been yeah. around know how to blend music and know how to spin those nine to five parties and transition from one style to another style to another style. Go back to a style. Come back to something brand new. Right. It's an art form, and we learned that at uh, those of us who are hip hop and down tempo learn that from our house brethren. Yes, yes. Uh, first, yes. Um, sisterin. Who, well, <laughs> for me, yes, sisterin. But um, they taught us that it, that's a real important thing. And trust me, other cities don't know how to do it like we do it. Yeah, no. And they come know. here and get mad because we be mad because he just slamming records all night. Right. And it's like hell. I can do that, and I have, and I will continue, but I like to hear a smoothless blend where you never know the next song is even in the mix until it's in the mix, and it's all up on you, and you're like, wow. Now, there's some good slam techniques that yeah. for, the, for, for the night, yeah. but that smoothless blend, definitely that's something we, yeah. all, we owe the house. And, so. I, and I, will say, uh, I will say thank you to Darrell. Because really, Darrell, I mean, you, you don't get enough credit for this. You, they call you Godfather House Hip Hop, sorry. But, you know, I, that my introduction to hip hop really was through Darrell. I mean, other than what I'd heard on the radio, you, he brought me a crate of records and was like, familiarize yourself. This is the <laughs> shit you need to know, you know? And I had to learn. I had to learn this new technique, this new music. And it really did expand my, my, my repertoire, but also expanded my mind in ways like I hadn't thought about before. Um, and from that, I really became a better DJ. I really became uh, more in tune with like all kinds of world music. You know, it really opened my mind uh, and my, my expression as an artist. And Danny, I mean, Fathom, DJ. You moderating now? Huh? You moderating now? I'm not moderating. I was going to talk be about better what we at did it together. You. She might be better at well, it. Well, let's, let's, no. I want to hear how she started first, too. Because you do the interviews. No, I was just going to say, we did a party together right. that was a complete fusion of everything. So you could hear acid jazz, hip hop, house music, jungle, whatever. You know, it, and it was, we had a, a live drummer. No, uh, what was yeah. she? Congo player. The, uh, the night was Tanya. called Femme Fatale. Yes. And we had a live percussionist, and it happened on Randolph. What was the name of the club? The Spot. It was called The Spot. The Spot. So, to make a long story short. Wait, before you go, I'm going to say this about Danny, and this is what I, one of the things I love about her. Okay. And he left, so he can't hear me say it, but Diz was the exact same way. They are the most dancingest, singingest, while they spin. Hell, if you don't like music and you watch them spin, you will love music because you see how much they love music when they do it. I love that about you so much. So I would just say my entry point was the radio and my mother's music and dancing. And probably less than 10 years ago, <laughs> I realized that there's this huge issue with danceable music. Because I I, I'm still differentiating what's not house from what we thought was house based on the radio. 
So we would hear jam on it, and it was a b-boy tune, but you would hear it in the club or you would hear it in other spaces. So it wasn't like, this is hip hop. So I think my entry point would be considered like electro hip hop, kind of Africa Bambada. So my entry point is hip hop. And a lot of people won't appreciate that, especially based on house being prominent during those areas. But considering the fact that I'm a 70s slash 80s baby, like Beat Street was the Bible. <laughs> so my the whole electro dance kind of vibe the 70s music that my mother fed me that was my point of entry my mother brought me to the north side and we would drive around on sunday nights on rush street and i knew i was out of place on the south side i knew that it, my whole entire experience as a child on the south side was like where are you from people would ask ask my mother where y'all from because you can't be from the south side with this kid Right? So I was always looking for a place to be. So when I got old enough to start venturing north, my destination for living had to be the north side because I knew I was going to be where I was supposed to be with music, with art. So we would take the train and, you know, I used to tag the trains um, and listen to hip hop music, listen to house music. WKKC was like the go to at the time. We had you know, Pink House and Barbecue Bobby was fusing, to me, they were fusing genres, um, kind of in a Ron Hardy way, where it's like, well, you know this is House because he's playing it on this show, but then there was like a kind of confusion because he would throw something that was danceable in but wasn't necessarily the same lane of music. So that's why my experience is always going to be a bunch of things because we listen to a bunch of things my goal was always to try to figure out how to make them work together and to be able to dance to them continuously so so that was like what 92 93 so by the time i got to the north side i ended up in like what uh andersonville or something like that to start and worked my way down to um belmont and something very dope was happening in Wicker Park. Yeah. Like the graffiti scene was kicking, the DJs, the music, it was the closest thing I could imagine to New York City. And because of Beach Street, I was trying to get on the street that was closest to the beat, and that was Milwaukee Avenue. So we, we wanted to be a part of what we thought was closest to New York culture. And that's not a diss to Chicago's culture, but if you're a TV kid, if you grew up in the 80s, and people were like, you know, watching television and videos and stuff, you wanted to find that place that mimicked what you saw on TV. So that's how I ended up in this community, like 90, what, I don't even remember, it's like 96, nine, mid 90s. Um, and my DJ situation came from being a skateboarder, came from being a graffiti artist. That's the elements, yeah, right? So like me deciding to pick up turntables I was collecting records, and somebody was just like, you know, a little Latin kid that sold me a skateboard was like, you should DJ. And I was like, what? Me, DJ? I was like, well, I do kind of got records, and I do want to try to figure out how to put them together. So of course, being a woman and a girl at that point, I would go to his house, and he would give me a little time, but it was like not enough time to me. So that's how you know you got the bug. I need more time, he won't give me more time. I'm just gonna go and find my own turntables. So one of my buddies had a, a straight arm uh, turntable and she said, you can have it. And I found a friend who had a little corny Gemini mixer and I had to figure out how to work it because the crossfader was broken. And I found another turntable at Midwest Stereo on Clark Street, purchased it started collecting records more vigorously. I was going to thrift stores and things of that nature. And, you know, just hanging around cool people. Like, as a kid, I didn't have an ID to get in Red Dog. Somebody thought I was cool enough, and they let me in. And I worked Red Dog's floors every time I was there. I, I worked my way to be there, meaning I danced my ass off to be there because I felt it and the DJs were doing what they were doing and I was influenced by everything that was happening on these four corners. Um, and of course, luckily, 
somebody hooked me up with Matt Kleiman, I guess his name was, who owned at the time the, what was the space on Belmont? Avalon? Yeah, it was on top of, okay, so what was the B-side? The B-side, the B-side. So some venue owners, Young Cats, owned the club, and um, I was associated with a magazine called Freedom Rag, um, and there was another magazine called Caught in the Middle, and they were, that was a hip hop magazine versus a literary arts magazine. And I worked for that company, a marketing company. And so they was like, Danny, you should come and open for Heather. <laughs> just some little records, right? And um, I was just like, all right, I'll bring a bag of records and I'll open for the openers for that night, B-side. And when I got finished DJing, he's like, we're opening a club called Buddha Bar. And that was on Grand. And he's like, we want you to do Wednesday nights. So I was like, I got a real gig every Wednesday for $50. <laughs> $50 from nine until two. So they could, but the spot came after. Yes, no, it was not. I, I had 1200s by the time we started doing the spot. I didn't have 1200s. When I lived in Wicker Park, I got 1200s after moving to Wicker Park. So yeah, the, the Buddha bar was my first DJ uh, residency. But yeah, so. It's interesting listening to each story, like to hear the similarities in the stories. Um, what I think one similarity of all four of us is we're, how do I say this? Lane creators. We created our own lane at some point in our life, which isn't easy to do and doesn't always work. The, the, the fact that we're sitting here 20, 30 years later showed that at some point it did work. Um, what was that time when you realized you was in your own lane? Whenever but these I, questions I, is I, deep, I, I'll start. Ponder. When I when I met, when I made enemies with a bunch of people. <laughs> Good answer. And uh, <laughs> I don't know what I did. But hey, that's Chicago, I, baby. I swear to God, I that's had, Chicago. I had a DJ crew I was hanging out with. Louis and Jose and, and all these people, and suddenly they weren't my friends anymore. Mm. And Friendly haters like, and hater friends. Well, I, I don't know. I we probably, all have. I, I'm sure I did something. You know, you, stuff goes to your head, and you act like a prima donna, and people are like, screw you, you know, and do that by yourself. And it's like, okay, well, I guess I do. And you learn your lessons, you take your lumps, and you, you make your own lane. And I had no choice back then. I was like, I'm, I'm who I am. I'm Lori Branch. I'm not affiliated with any crews. I'm, I'm doing my own thing. And I had to go and get my own jobs, get my own residencies, make my own way without the support of these, these guys who would push me there, who helped push me there in the first place. So I, I remember that. I had to make a lane because I never had a lane. Just being honest, being different and being told that I was different said, you just got to do what you got to do because these people don't understand you. So, and that's not different today. <laughs> it's just a matter of being confident about making, forging for regardless to the adversities that you have. And that's what I continue to pride myself on doing. Two, okay. I think I, uh, I can pinpoint, or pinpoint when I felt like I was making some headroom in uh, doing my own thing. Um, I had reached a point uh, with DJing where I was playing more down tempo, and uh, Chicago, you know, has always been a house music up tempo scene. So I just got bored with the music, and uh, everything was so repetitive and. There were elements of the music that I really liked, the samples. So I started researching all of that, and at the same time, acid jazz was coming out, and it sounded like the original music that was being sampled, but it was brand new. So I quit playing up-tempo music and doing like regular club gigs, and I started doing my own events. And it was weird, because you know it took a little while to catch on here, more down-tempo nights, but I felt like I had did something different because now a lot of the club owners that I used to work for were now coming to my gigs and asking me, you know, how can we get you to do a night? So 
it was different because I could do it on my own terms. And that's kind of where I, I think things changed a little bit. All right. <clears throat> I, I guess at this time, open up for questions. So, so look, so, so I got a question for all of you guys, if you don't mind me asking. Um, where would you say, if you had to point to one specific venue out of all of the venues that you worked, what space would you say was like the, the one? That, that's real easy. I don't want to jump in, but there's only one venue that really, really does that for me, and that's the elbow room. And, and because they pretty much gave you like the entire, like how you wanted to culture and curate the night? Yeah, there was a lot of freedom. Um, I gotta give it up to John Litz. He's the, uh, who's the guy who brought me in. Um, we were there on two nights, Sunday with the, the band, Liquid Soul. And then I had my hip hop night, Blue Groove Lounge on Mondays. So that was fun because, I mean it was fun while it lasted, you know, it was, it was a <laughs> until the condos went up across the street. Oh. Course. And then, you know, people hanging out, urinating and smoking. <laughs> I knew, you know, then we moved it to Double Door and we moved around a little bit. But that was just a, a, such a cool venue because we got to experiment. Like, just the idea of doing a lounge, we called it the Blue Groove Lounge. In even the early days, John, we would, would go back and forth and call each other. Oh, I thought of this name. Oh, we could call it this, we could call it that. We were so excited about the night. And then the fact that we called it a lounge, John had this idea that he was going to go out and buy all these like lamps and furniture and put it on stage and people could hang out while we were DJing and that lasted like one week. We were like, get off the stage. <laughs> Everybody was just hanging out. But that was a lot of fun. But Elbow Room was a, a game changer, I think. It set the tone. Um, okay, so there, I got a tie. So there's two clubs. There was one club called R2 Underground, which actually was the music box before it was the music box. So this club was on Lower Wacker Drive, and y'all might re you may have heard stories about Ron Hardy and the music box and, and this venue. This was before he got there. Uh, it was owned by this, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his name, but he used to own the Ritz that was uh, near the north side. He opened this other club. Craig Cannon helped me get this job. And, uh, it really was my first residency. So this was around 82, 83, where it was like, you know, you had to be there every week and you were the DJ and it's all night. And I'm like, you know, cause I was used to doing parties where you get in, you get out, you got an hour, two hours, what have you. Um, and I, I, it was for that reason. It was because it was my night and I got to craft, a, a, you know, a, an experience for people. Like this is what the beginning of a night sounds like. This is what the middle of it sounds like. And this is how you bring people down. This is how you bring them back up. And it, you know, it was dance, it was disco, dance, house music, a little punk, maybe a little down tempo thrown in, but I really enjoyed that experience because I was by myself creating that night. And it always, those, those memories are very strong for me. And the other place was, was Red Dog. And Red Dog was for me, uh, and Lord Links is a close, you know, next one, but Red Dog for me was just uh, such a cool venue. And it really was my first experience seeing all these people from all sides of the city and the suburbs. People came at all ages and they were there and it was just, you know, just a groove all night long. And no, you know, it was all love. Um, and I just loved that. I felt like I was part of a family there. I loved being, you know, e you know doing the parties with, with DeRoe was great. But, you know, we, I did parties where I was just the DJ there. I think. I don't know, Jesse, you were probably some, doing some of those too, but had a lot of experience with other DJs and was just like a family. And I just loved Red Dog. I was sad when we left there. Not to cut you off, but Lori just reminded me I have a tie also, uh, Smart Bar. That was my very first uh, gig. And I d mainly because it was my first 21 and over club. It was my nine to five, but mainly because some of you younger DJs would not know anything about this, but they had a library of music there and I learned a lot of the music and about doing sets and playing all different type of music because of Smart Bar and their library. So that's probably my, one of my ties. I mean, mine is, is obvious. Oh, right. What's uh, Lower Links and Red Dog. Yeah. Saturdays at Red Dog. Yeah. Um, Lower Links because, look, I started Lower Links, it was an open mic night 
And honestly, I started it just because I wanted a place to rap. I had a group. We were getting songs together. I wanted to perform them. What better way to do it? I, I copied the poetry open mic format. Uh, we started at Lizard Lounge here in Wicker Park. We got kicked out of there real quick. It was just, which is funny because they had a black night, but my night was too black for them. You know what I'm saying? So probably because they tagged up the bathrooms and all kinds of stuff like that. So we moved, <laughs> thanks to uh, PJ put me in touch with Lee Jones over at Lower Links, and Lee loved our night. I remember the last one, she was dancing on the table, yeah. and the cop showed up, and I'm like, well, it's the last one, y'all late now. But um, that was definitely, like, you know, that, to this day, people think my name is Lower Links, you know what I'm saying, or Big Lip, or, you know, um, I used to scream out, who got big lips? So they always thought that was my name. And it's like, no, that's not my name. <laughs> um, and then Red Dog, I owe, that to, I owe that to a bunch of people. Like that, now I've been blessed to work with like real people that believed in me. And that's the key. That's if huge. If you find someone to believe in you, that's man, huge. keep them right here. That's Because that's going to take you to the next level. Um, but... Actually, Domingo was the one who opened my eyes to the, the idea of a hot Saturday night, urban night, because he did it first at uh, Otis's. Otis's. And, um, <laughs> and after Otis ended, I was like, well, if he can do it, I can do it. So I did it at, at Red Dog, and whew, then were the good days. You know, like the money was pouring in, but just like everything else, the hate came. You know, unnecessary. Other clubs were mad because we were charging $20 a head and had a line around the building from the back of the alley all the way to North Avenue, even in the rain and snow. And they wanted to know why they weren't doing that. And the neighborhood was mad because we were bringing people from who weren't from the new neighborhood into Red Dog. And they didn't, you know, when you have a million dollar house, you don't want to see that all the time. So. The hate came and, and that ended, but those were my two like defining club moments, history or whatever, yeah. So one of the things that I wanted to reference, just based on the idea of confidence and what we're dealing with currently would be um, having someone bless you with a space that you get to stretch out and create your, your, your vibe. And especially now with the residencies or the spaces that are like employing us being so transient yeah. you don't get a green light about what's going to happen every week and what kind of people are going to be there so for me i think one of my favorite places to work would be to start would be funky buddha yeah. um and particularly because that that venue was crafted to draw a specific group of people that were underserved specifically um, and then second would be the first cinnabar which was crafted to serve a group of people who were underserved and those people were African Americans um, I have a relationship with the the owner of those spaces today we talk at least five hours or seven hours a week and specifically to talk about the concept of serving a group of people in an area that was, wasn't necessarily accepting. Um, there was always the, the challenge of diversifying and you know, incorporating, but to what degree were we accepted being black, being gay, right? Or LGBT, whatever you might want to call yourself, having a space that was welcoming for you, your style, and your sound is hugely important even today. Um, just recently, I had an opportunity in a space in this area, and they were specific about me not playing house music. Really? Specific. Like, it was, we don't want you to play house at all. And I was like, how does that work in Chicago? Um, and it, it, I'm an analytical person. So I started think about, thinking about how we're dancers by nature and how other cultures might be uncomfortable about how we express ourselves. 
and um, and that's why Funky Buddha and Cinnabar would be my chosen spaces because I was given a green light every week and I never had anyone standing over me saying play this play this don't play that and people were just gelling in this community and you know that's that's one of the challenges I think we face currently is just like keeping spaces diverse and making everyone feel comfortable in them so Buddha and Cinnabar that's so weird. It's like it used to be don't play any hip hop. Yeah. Right, right, Took right. the house. Right, so, so it's the opposite. And, and even to say 90s hip hop, which is the essence. But you know what? I think people really limit themselves when they use those terms because they're hip hop songs that can be played in a house set like you well, said. Well, a lot of the hip hop songs were sampling house music, right. which and, and, which even blurred the lines. And, and I believe Chicago did itself a disservice because when it first hip hop first hit here, we wanted to disassociate from house so bad yeah. that even when they were doing hip house, yeah. we didn't want nothing to do with that. Fast Eddie, we don't want nothing to do with that. That's then you turn around and Wu-Tang Clan or Method Man, no, Ghostface, I'm sorry, the Sir Shay La Femme, yes. which was a house song in Chicago. Well, that's, that we that's grew up with, R&B. That song should have always, <laughs> but it should have always, it was played in house sets. Always, it, that, yes. it sh- that, The hip hop version should have been made by a Chicago person who was there dancing to that. You know what I'm saying? Not a New I hate York categories. Guy. I hate categories. Right. I Once get it. Once you put it in the category, it, it kind of, I mean, Jesse is known for like, I'm going to play what I want, you know? No matter what. That's why I love him. Like, like you already I mean, know. I, I like, pre- that's why I appreciate his style of doing. And he plays. And he plays to an audience that has no problem coming up to the booth, asking constantly for something. And that's not an easy thing to do. Darrell used to uh, get on me because I'd feel like I was having a really great night at Red Dog, and he'd be like, "That's just because you're playing what you think people want to hear." And I'd be like, "Well, yeah." Dun, 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 dun. Why, what's wrong with that? He was like, don't do that, you know. And so he would check me once in a while. And I'm like, okay, I'll, 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 I'll hear that. I'll hear that. Because there's a certain degree. There was another, t- there was the other cat who used to throw the parties, a short guy at, at uh, Red Dog. He would hire me to do stuff. Anyway, he would say, I want you to sell out to the crowd a little bit. You know, I'm like, why are you asking me? He's like, because I know you'll sell out to the crowd a little bit. <laughs> and I'm like, so what that means is, like, are you, are you divorcing yourself from, like, your true artistry to just sort of please people. And I think for me, it was like, I gotta, I gotta thread the needle, because I like people to dance. I do not like playing for an empty dance floor. If there's one person out there, I wanna make sure I'm playing what they want to hear so that they dance. And so for real, you know, how do you thread that needle that you're pushing the boundaries, that you're introducing new music, that you're breaking stuff that should be broken and not just kind of satisfying the crowd, you know? And that's, that's a tricky, it's a tricky dance, balance. Dance. I'm sure there are questions, though. <laughs> are there any questions from our audience? Please. Y'all bored. Don't be bored. Because we can talk about the future if you want. Because it's bright. It's still bright. The future? Um, I'm, st- I'm still... I think the best way to thread the future for younger people um, is production because they have an opportunity to reference your music online. I most certainly think that social media and creating um, content on different platforms helps younger people discover. Recently, just earlier this um, year, a woman, younger woman, she's probably like 24, 25, she moved here from Boston and she's on Instagram, and she searched the hashtag of Chicago house music, and my name came up, and she reached out to me in my, my DM, and it's like, oh, where do you play? What, can we go out? And I went out with her, and she, you know, she, she totally loves disco and soul. She loves hip hop. She's a younger white woman, just, just full of energy, and just vibrant about our culture, and, the, ex- the true experience. So having conversation with her, she's just like, well, I'm kind of disappointed that there aren't more club spaces for this music to be played. And I'm like, you know, you kind of missed 
the period that when it yeah, yeah it was like you were just being conceived we were like really popping and, and wicker park or what have you but in those ways being in spaces on social media where people can discover your work is the first lane and then kind of being receptive to them and and incorporating some music that they know and that's one of the reasons why I still appreciate working in this area because I am referencing their music and I am um, interested in figuring out how to commingle the past with the present and the future and that's what DJing has always been to me is storytelling uh, I agree with freak on that I heard him earlier let the kids be the kids I used to be bitter and be like, oh, that's garbage. What are they listening to? Now I'm like, you know what? Let them be the kids so in 25 years, they could be sitting right here doing what we're doing now for what we started 25 years. We can't like put our thing on them because didn't nobody put their thing on us. Like my daddy wasn't like, you ain't listening to nothing but jazz. This is, but, this is but, Miles but, Davis. But Take it. No. This is Nina Simone. But see, Take it. But in Aidley, when, the, when your father and your mother played that music, you just knew it was good. And no, you, no and doubt. It, it and, wasn't and, a force and, fan, I say, but give it them was the seeds. available. Give them the seeds, but let them decide what of kind course, of tree of they're going to grow. You know, we can't, we can't bring them to hip hop and acid jazz because they on something totally different. Let them do that. But when, when I think they're, they're ready, they're there, though. when they're ready, just they're like there. a lot of us did, you went back and got daddy's records. And was like, yo, that's some, that's dope. Like when you think about Jamila Woods, and you think oh, yeah. about um, who is this this newer girl? I can't. Think it's of her always going to be someone she young. Sounds like doing what you want them to do. She sounds like Erica Badu. She sounds like Erica Badu. So if you can anchor on those younger those younger artists, and then kind of culture, well, I'm not trying to infringe on your people, but let me expose you to where we know they got their sound from. It just It's just connecting the dots. I, right. can, but I'm not I, talking about the people that like Jamila Woods. I'm talking about the people that like the stuff that you wouldn't listen to right. with somebody else's ears. You know what like I'm saying? Trap music. <laughs> what, I'm not going to put no names okay. on it, okay. but you know what I'm talking about. But that's they think. That's all good. Let them do that. I think, I'm, I'm I think it's somewhere in the middle. I do think that Young people, like when we were young, we kind of reached up, like, okay, I'm gonna go to the warehouse. It's a lot of older people there, but this is what I aspire towards, you know, once I got there. And it wasn't necessarily a whole lot of people saying, come in, little girl, you know, we have a party for you. <laughs> uh, but so, you know, you gotta have that engine in there that, that kind of oh, fire, like this young woman had for you, saying, I wanna connect to something. And be and and to be receptive if that does come. I I don't think I was listening to the panel before. I don't think it's our place to like go find that. You know that's a little creepy. You know what I'm saying? That's I'm in my fifties. I'm not going to a club with twenty one year olds. I'm just not. You know. I think you got to be available. Well, you know I, there, I, was I, a, I did, there was a there was a there was a scene day, in Treme. Was, yeah. Where he was sitting at the bar, and this little uh, Treme was on HBO. It was about New Orleans jazz and food culture and he was sitting at he was a musician and he was sitting at the bar and this little Japanese guy came up to him and he was like, You're so and so and so and so he's like, Yeah. He's like, You play horn on so and so and so and so with so and so and so and so on drums and so and so and so and so at so and so and so and so studio. That's what I want. I want some little Japanese kid to come up to me and be like, Yo, you Darrow Wicks. You did bread dog on North Avenue. You did Lower Links, blah, blah, blah. You produce so and so and so and so. And you, you rap have to with make so and so and so. open to that. And I think social media is a way that has done oh, that. Oh, definitely. Like, I, but that's know, what I'm saying. Thanks yes. to the archivists, I'm going to get my dream because they're going to put together the archive and make it available to the world. And yep. then the world will know about but, my but, small but, but contribution. Guess, to so this. the question is, is have you're you're not gonna just allow the archives to do that right you're still producing you're still creating somebody just did that somebody handed me my blessing in this room this brother right here rolled up on me and said that apocalyptic conversation that song you put out with maggie brown and kahari b that's chicago so that's why i said production because like we we got i got work to do like i feel like for me it's starting again like i'm i'm about to accept a uh, um, a opportunity to be director for music at a venue that's opening and I'm going to curate these DJs and I'm, I'm going, going to continue to produce music and drawing younger people to me based on continuing. It's important. 
Like, I don't want, I don't, I, I'm, I love the archivist, but I got a future and I have to continue to align myself with people who are, who are doing. So that makes us have to deal with younger people to an, answer the question <laughs> that Eric asked earlier. How do we segue? Continue. And the babies are going to come to you. I have a record sale that I'm doing. And I got these younger Jedis who are like, oh, I want to buy this music. You got that, art, that, that, that uh, Tribe Called Quest? Here. I want you to have it. I want you to know your roots. I'm not trying to impose. But if we're extending ourselves in spaces where they can find us, that makes, that's, the magnet, that's the magnetizing. Because they're like, well, who are you? And then I go, <laughs> I'll let you figure it out. And then they go to the internet or Instagram and they're like oh so we got to be in there we don't have to haunt them or show up at the booty booty club or something but we do have to have spaces where we're magnetizing and having conversation and allowing them to lead and then you know imp not imposing but offering yes. our history I, I agree I agree it, it's a two-way street but I also got a blessing today. We're not done. Because we're, we're not done. That's the thing. That's what I was going to say. I got we're a blessing today for my future. We're too not today. done. Coming here. Uh, I've reconnected with Skylar, one of your archivists, on a whole different thing that I want to do. I want to do a, a black action figure um, exhibit. Uh, historically, how we've been represented and what our kids grew up looking at. So. I do have the future in mind. I'm just on something else now. You know what I'm saying? I, I I, music is always the love, and I'm going to tie music into it somehow. Haven't figured it out yet, but it's, it's the same thing. I have an idea, and I want to bring it to life. You know what I'm saying? To me, that's what I've always done. I had an idea, and it tried. I mean, some I did, some I didn't. Some I shouldn't have. I think it's a balance, you know, kind of connecting with the younger crowd you know even with the DJ thing um, you know I curate mixes on Vocalo radio and it, it's I'm so torn sometimes with parties and younger crowds because years ago I used to like look for a younger crowd and be like oh it's gonna be great and now it's kind of to the point where I like kind of cringe I'm like I'm gonna have to play this I'm gonna have to play that so I'm always pleasantly surprised when I connect with a crowd and they're just open and that's been a nice, pleasant thing. And just meeting DJs with younger or more up-and-coming DJs and just kind of peep into what they're doing, that's just, but without being too creepy. <laughs> and, and at the same time, too, I think we need to work harder on keeping our own crowd engaged. Like, people are getting old. They're, they don't want to go out anymore. Look at this. This event is about them. It's not about us. Because we wouldn't have been nothing without them. They no, should true. be in here with us. But we don't have, they're not coming out. Like, and but that's what we got to learn, how we re-engage them. Man, we I'm had them We had them biting at the bit in the 90s. I'm in a children. different, spiritually, I'm I, in a different space. You got space. kids? And I got kids. And jobs. They're not getting and I appreciate There, there, there has to be something to where we can re-engage those same people. It's a lot of work. I, I, I talked to a bunch that. of people a this week and tried to explain what they're doing here. No. And I'm like, look, it's your story. You need to come out. I think they would be better for it. I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, I know that when we go out, I'm always like, why don't I do this every week? This is amazing. I'm having such a great time. And then I remember why I don't do it every week. Because <laughs> you can't do the same thing 20, 30 years later. And so right, I, but, I don't but think... But when you talk about every month... You know what I'm saying? I'm saying we do we do the brunch once a month. True. And 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 the greatest joy, the greatest joy for me is to reconnect with those people when I, they say, "Oh man, yeah. I ain't seen you in 15 years. I ain't seen you in 10 years. I ain't seen you in 20 years." I'm saying, don't. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's our job. I don't. I I think that it, that same motivating factor that propels y younger people to be out you know, and to seek out what's, what's going to move them, that, that hasn't gone away. Those, that we still need those spaces. We still need to, to have safe spaces for all kinds of people in all parts of the city so that they can have that same experience. What we experience then and even now is that same energy that is a life, it's a life force. And, and people need to have that. And they need to have venues where they can, they can hear this 
and they can experience that. So we don't have to do anything, I think, except for try to create. We're at a place now where we got to create those spaces. You know, maybe we are. Ownership. The, yes, maybe we are, you know, like doing what, what's happening here, you know, at Silver Room and with, with uh, other venues. You know, we, now we're, we're the ones. We're the ones who have right, to create Aren't you saying spaces. the same thing that I'm saying? Create a space where the people who were there can reconnect to what uh, they were I'm doing? I'm not saying no. no people who were there. I get, what, saying, I get what she's saying. Here, she's tell, she's tell saying, be, saying be, be, be saying. available. <laughs> be available and be open for whomever's going to come. I get tired of trying to convince old people to come out. I have a very young energy, and I would, and if I can invite you, I, 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 I honestly, I care not that you got a thousand kids. Everybody has an excuse. Um, the internet is full of that. Like, yeah, girl, I'm coming, I'm coming. Then five, five months later, when your your residency is over because you didn't get supported, you know. Then it's, oh, I was going to show up, man. I was so trying to, I don't have a lot of time for that. I'm more concerned about entertaining people who are there or who will be there and be interested, who I can feed, who are, who are receptive. Um, and I think that's why we really have to tap into who is there now. And that doesn't, that's not, not to disrespect the history, because I want to give the history, but I also know that in order to engage them, I have to learn and incorporate who they are. And so that's, that's the challenge, because like, when you think of, think of it from a business perspective, whoever comes out are the people we're supposed to service. If we don't show up, then we service who's in front of us. This is a business, too. Art, art is most certainly the, 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 the front, at the forefront, but we also have to contend, contend, we have a contingency based on being hired to service the people who are coming in, buying drinks, and supporting on a regular basis. I um, think you guys are heading in a, a good direction, especially what you guys are doing. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's key, because we, we naturally want to reconnect with people, want to relive the glory days, want to see all those folks, but you just got to keep pushing it forward and look for even a different crowd that's out there that's right. that can appreciate it, like you were talking about. And if everybody, c if it all lines up and, you know, you can bring out the family, a family friendly, all ages stuff, that's always going to help. Uh, you know, I'm doing some uh, park events, Blue Groove summer sessions, doing them around the city. But, but no, you're, you're right. That's natural. We always want to try to get that crowd that used you to support us. You definitely want to have your people in the room. But yeah. You'll be disappointed. It, you'll be disappointed. You'll be, you'll be, let me just, I mean, let I'm, me just tell you right now. You'll be disappointed. What normally happens, I'll run into people I haven't seen in a while. I'll try to invite them out. And before I can even tell them more about it, oh, we're going to be out of town. I haven't even told you the date. You got an auto excuse. That's how old my people That's are. That's an auto excuse. They already, yeah. Girl, I got We kids. don't go out no more. Okay, you don't. Girl, we, my we, grandmother is <laughs> coming to town. We got to keep it moving. Keep it Folks moving. will find us, keep but don't rely on that old, older crowd. It's great when we see them. I mean, and then if you have a variance of options, so like every other Thursday we have this jazz set, so you don't have to worry about the 22. You, I would love to have younger people, but you, know, you have other options for other events that says this is appropriate for the family, this is that, you know, after it's nine o'clock when y'all trying to go to bed to get up and feed the kids in the morning, that thing. If you have a few options, then people can kind of feed into where they're supposed to be. And, and, and let's give it up. The one person I know in Chicago that do it is Eric. Yes. The yep. black party and the, and right. the jazz. I, man, I went to the, one of the jazz joints he did and all them old people were there in their chairs trying to step sitting down i'm like oh this is some next he got the i mean i'm calling them old and i'm old you feel me so yeah i give it up to eric for, for reconnecting with the older crowd most certainly real quick um before i get this to her so i reconnected with a friend recently right from from my past and great to see her we was best friends growing up and after seeing her and hugging her and we talked about the block and who all went to do whatever, whatever, trying to create, a, um, trying to continue a friendship with her was impossible because she couldn't get off the block. That's right. So it's like we have to, it's re reconnecting with somebody is fine, but if that person you're reconnecting with is not willing to now go to the future evolve. and create new memories with you, yeah. then. Gotta evolve. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
kind of going touching on um, the point about how people aren't quote unquote coming out anymore. Um, I think one thing that we all have to consider is that we are in a very technological um, uh, era, so that there that there are many ways to approach um, crowds that are going to because there is. We are dealing with also a uh, decreased mobility because people are aging, because people have different um, needs that um, affect how they commute, if they can even get out the house at all. So uh, one thing that I always talk about with my peer group, because, you know, I do video, I do all of these things, you know, one way to, I mean, you have things like tiny desks, you have things like, you have lives. There are many ways to um, to get a crowd going and not necessarily make it to where you're you're actually in a physical space that's where social media helps because you, you get know, the FB live you yeah. get the Instagram live I have a show that I stream every Wednesday called morning love for and it and it happens at 10 30 in the morning for people who are at work so they kind of get Right. The, a little bit of the experience of things that they might be missing. And so unfortunately, some people subscribe to only those spaces, which is fine. Right. But right. that, yeah, we definitely have available. We have right. to be available to reach them where they are. I exactly. Agree. And I know that there are, you know, there are artists that are like, no, nah, like, I don't, I don't do that. You know, <laughs> like they kind of like anti tech for whatever reason, but True. which I can understand. But it's just the thing where different needs are going to have to be met because you know, things do change. And it's still an art form, whether it's alive or not. You know, some people be like, oh, well, it's not a real thing because, you know, I'm not in front of nobody. And I'm like, well, you, whoever is watching you is, is still the crowd. So, it, you know, it should And it's practice. You know, and it's very it's good practice. practice. So it's, it's a practice. And, the, and, and of course, it's a way to reach people that you may not reach in the real world as well. Exactly. Because there's a contingency of, you know, there's the idea that we have to, you know, kind of extend ourselves to folks that are not, we should be extending ourselves to folks who aren't in front but of us. But how do you monetize that? Um, it depends. If you're, if you have, if you have products available online, if you have music online, every time you do a show, you make sure to drop that you have Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Beatport, Google you, Plus, iTunes, the, um, source. I got a, a rhyme that I did do you see at the, the, the end the of the article show. about the, the girl. She was an influencer. She had two million followers yeah. and she tried to start her own clothing line and she couldn't sell 36 shirts. There's, there's, there's a, there's. Hell, I sold 22 and only got a thousand friends. The, the influencer hat is a, is a, is an interesting thing to wear because you end up spending a lot, a lot of time making content that may not monetize itself. But then there's the idea of doing a clump of podcast, placing it, and allowing it to grow. So it's, it's not to say you have to do it all the time, but you definitely have to have content that's discoverable. So that people put are put in a space, discoverable hashtags, discoverable. I'll, I have so many damn accounts on on the internet. I don't circle all of them, but I'm where I think I need to be to be able to kind of to kind of reach people or at least link them to my my experience. Old dogs and new tricks. We gotta learn them. <laughs> like we have to learn them. This is kind of changing up just a little bit, but you all mentioned that your nine to fives included $100 an hour, $50 an hour, I mean $50 a, a night, sorry, $50 a night. And there has been a lot of talk about how artists aren't being compensated fairly. Do you still see that trend going on right now today that they're still being paid $100 a night for an entire show? Yes. Thank you. On the well, panel, but yes. Hallelujah, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. Um, thank you for ask, asking that question. So the thing of it is, is like we do a lot of work for free. Um, I think about it all the time. And one of, one of my challenges currently, and I've been able to do some consulting work for a few venues to try to get them to understand the idea of what, what we need to have in order to do our work, in order to make it a little bit more palatable. Um, there's the three hours instead of nine to five DJing for $50, that kind of compensates, that's making sure that the equipment that they have on site works and that it'll make it easier for us 
to do that job. But there's still the idea that on the internet, what we're doing is putting equity and advertising into spaces without any compensation. And that's huge. It's huge. When you check in, that's advertising. When you tag them in posts, that's advertising. Um, I have a dream, right? So my, well, my dream is coming true. I won't go into detail because the, the venue's not quite ready yet. But the dream is to create a space where we can get a percentage in that company or in that venue. We should be seeking a percentage based on that equity. Before I even leave my house to DJ, I've probably marketed this place so well without compensation. So we need to talk about the idea of what it's like. I think we have, I think like the spaces that I work now, I work there because of the fact that they properly compensate and they don't exploit the time. And you know, there is still that idea that as a brand person that you have to put the marketing into it to draw more people to you. But if you can gauge, and we have to be cognizant of our worth and gauging the amount of time and energy we want to put in. There, there, no, there was a time in the, more in the, the, what they were talking about was early 90s, 80s. There was a time in the late 90s mm -hmm. when DJs, certain DJs was getting paid so for shorter DJs. sets. Yeah. Uh, I had one guy came in and opened and got the same as the closer. Right. And then he went and did another club and probably got doubled out of the other club. So there was a time when DJs were getting paid. What happened was Serato and a bunch of kids start undercutting those DJs. Oh, I do it for 50, now they went back to the $50 and $100. And so a, a club owner's like, oh wait, I can get him. And he, he done copied everything he did, cause that's all they really did. Cause now they have digital music. He had to go out and buy records, physical records. And if he couldn't find it, he couldn't play it. Now they got Serato, they're playing MP3s. The internet has everything. Dero, the, the one thing that I think is important to note is in entertainment, there's only a certain amount of people who are going to make enough money to make a living off of their craft. Right. So if you think about actors, 2% of all actors get paid enough to make a living off acting. I don't know what the percentage is for DJs. I'm guessing it's somewhere around there. It, it's just difficult. Because but you know, DJing is crazy because there's well, some DJs that make millions. And yes, yeah, so does Michael Jordan. But how many other basketball players are in the world? No, no you doubt. Know, no I mean, doubt. My, my point is that, it, there, that, that you, there is a hustle. It is a real hustle. If you're trying to make a living as an artist, as a DJ in Chicago, anywhere, really, you have to do mind, heart, body, and soul. You know, you got to think around the clock about all the different ways I can 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 monetize what I'm what I'm doing um, and it's a very difficult thing to do that's why most DJs don't do it you know I mean when I had to do it it was very hard because you got to take some of these jobs where you got somebody go and play this play this play that I, yeah I was you just saying in the late 90s there were more jobs yes. that were paying that kind better it, it's, but it's amounts it's and those, they don't exist anymore and I know, I mean, you know I, those clubs are gone that club scene is gone, you know, there, there's also $20 the at the door, no matter what. There's also corporate opportunities, which I engage, and, and those pay really well. So I think, and I think that if you create some kind of format for yourself where you're branding and marketing on a regular basis, you can get corporate opportunities and engage those club spaces. So I think we just need to be a little more open to how it can work because there are there there are DJs here who are who are compensated well you know to curate mixes I've curated mixes for Home Depot and that's a that's a great check so I think it's how we create relationships and with whom that are garnering better opportunities I don't I don't want to create the idea that you cannot make a living DJing or being an artist, I definitely want to get people empowered. It's just what you're willing to invest, and then having a mentor. And I, and I would like to be a better mentor for people who are interested in how it can work and how we should navigate, and how we're supposed to help each other. So that's, a, again, being available. And I, and I would never say, don't do it. You know, I mean, and, and certainly you can get paid. I still get paid. I will still do an event where they, it's a very nice paycheck. And uh, it doesn't happen every week, but it happens enough 
to where it's like, oh, this is, this is nice. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. You know, um, celebrities will pay you. You know, corporations will pay you. Uh, you know, absolutely. It is about relations, and it's about being good to people because your reputation precedes you. You know, you people, people know who's, who's a pain in the ass to work with, and they're not going to work with you because someone has already told them before you even, you know, came into existence, don't work with this person. So there's a lot that goes into making a career out of it. It's all those things. Jesse? It, it is tricky because, you know, I've seen both sides of that. Um, I made good money DJing, and, you know, sometimes I'm up for a gig with somebody who's just coming up, and they're going to charge what they're going to charge, and that's what's going to set the standard for what people are getting charged. I guess it's just about making yourself unique. Uh, you know, when, when the digital thing came, everybody was, you know, saying, oh, you know, I got, a, I got so-and-so's library. I can, I, I can DJ just like them. But it's just like, you know, the digital thing is a blessing for some of us who carried records and stuff. It's, it's just another tool, and it, it, it is... It is an easy way into the DJ game without that investment. But, you know, it's just like the sports thing. You know, you can all, I always somehow come back because you have the major million dollar players and then you have everybody who starts in the very beginning. And there's that range of DJs in Chicago that are making, there's, there's your Derek Carters and your Bad Boy Bills that are walking with 10 grand or eight grand or something. And then there's the guy who's from the $50. So it's like you just got to make yourself unique in a way or just, you know, you just can't be that other DJ. You can't put yourself on a level that when, say, this is our budget is $150. Well, if you feel that you're worth more than that, you just you have to be willing to walk away from that gig. Yeah. And you really have to kind of do something different that makes you stand out where they say, you know, I'd rather get so and so. He's a little bit more. But but this you know or that so just make yourself unique and you know don't be afraid to walk away from some of these gigs um, to prove a point because a lot of times they'll come back and up the money so I'm gonna have to leave it there want to thank my panelists and my moderator <laughs> and I mean, we're striking a set, but any of them here, if anybody want to further conversations or uh, talk to any, any of us here, he's definitely welcome to still um, you know, hold these conversations. Also, if you guys want to as well, you can set up time with, um, is Lauren still here? Because we... We definitely want those in the room who, who have history and have experiences in, in spaces throughout Chicago's social black culture, black social culture, to be able to tell their stories and and document your stories. So that's Miss Lauren Laurie back there. You can link up with her, Skylar. You can link up with. We definitely want to hear your stories. We want to get them documented. If you have, if you know anybody that have like old flyers, pictures. Anything just from any momentous moment for you and, and without uh, your social culture, we want to make sure that's documented. So definitely get with us. The next event we're doing is July 27th at Reunion Chicago on North Avenue, 2557 West North Avenue. That's going to force, that's going to focus on uh, the Latinx contribution um, to house culture and to uh, uh, social culture. And then we're gonna do September 7th, at, um, it's gonna be the West Side Edition at the West, uh, West Side Justice Center. And then October, I forget the day, October 19th, oh, here we go. Um, we're gonna focus on the North Side in terms of the Belmont, Boys Town um, edition, all of that. So got a lot of more gigs uh, coming up, trying to get these things documented. So again, we wanna thank y'all for coming. I mean, we really want to thank we really want to thank Eric from the Silver Room and Natalie for opening up for us, and thank y'all for spending y'all afternoon with us.